Guys, I want to thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru, the optics authority. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com. If you have any interest in buying optics or have any glassing questions, whether it be tripods, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, range finders, anything to do with glassing, give Cody a call 702-847-8747. That's extension 2 or you can email him at optics at gohunt.com. You can also send him a text or call him on his cell phone at 602-399-3699. Guys, right now at GoHunt.com Insider, you can take advantage of the free trial. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott. You're going to be able to take advantage of a free trial of the Insider. GoHunt is always adding more value for their Insider members. They've now added real 3D maps as a part of Insider for no additional cost. What an incredible value. Very soon, they're going to have their mobile app up as well. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J Scott and sign up for a free trial. If you're already an Insider member, it's automatically part of your Insider membership. And you can just go to the Maps tab up at the top once you sign in as an Insider. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. To find out more, you can go to KUIU.com, Kuyu.com. They're a direct-to-consumer company. They sell everything off of the Kuyu.com website. I also do a lot of question and answer on my Instagram where I'm answering questions about guys wanting to know about gear about Kuyu, so tune into my Instagram. I want to thank Kuyu for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. Again, thanks to all the sponsors of my podcast. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have my friend Creed Christianat on the line. Creed, how you doing? Uh, Jay, I'm doing great, actually. Well, good. Yeah, it looks like you guys just came off a great hunt. Uh, it looks like a friend of yours had a rifle hunt in southern Arizona. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, it was a good time. Um, uh, my friend John, he drew this uh, late December coos tag. Um he got lucky, drew it with minimal points, and uh, as you know, these tags are getting harder and harder to get. So I'm glad to see him have drawn that tag. Um, you know, I, I intended to hunt with him a little bit, you know, the as many days as I could, and it ended up being I was lucky to get one day hunting in with him. So uh, we planned that day for you know when five days ago or, or so. Yeah. Uh, late teen you know like the 17th or 18th or something like that um and uh we met up he you know he was kind of just giving me free reins to choose where we hunted and i was familiar with the unit and uh i'd been kind of waiting for a guy with a rifle tag in this unit because there was some country i wanted to hunt but i felt like we could really turn up some big bucks in that country it'd been a few years since i'd been in there um we met up and, uh, you know, it's rare I get to have my brother along, but he's kind of a mule deer hunter, but he jumped in with us and we, we know we drove up into that country and got up to a glassing point before the sun came up. And, uh, it didn't take long before we started seeing deer. It was nice, cold, crisp morning. I mean, perfect conditions. I think it was, uh, like 16 degrees when we parked the truck. Um, just perfect. And as the sun, started to rise the deer uh rose with it and i mean it was just a phenomenal morning um create a couple mm-hmm. questions here um just just to kind of lead up into this hunt so from what i gather this is not a place or this is not a buck the buck that you ended up harvesting is not a buck like you'd been watching this was a unit that you knew but you hadn't been in in a while but you had some country in mind that you wanted to go kind of explore and kind of had an idea of what you were looking for can i ask you with that being said what were those ingredients as far as what were you looking for what were you thinking going into it well to be honest jay uh, so this is country that i've been in a bunch it's just been a little while and uh so i was very familiar with 
the genetics in that country i that that's really the biggest thing is i knew that country puts out really good deer um traditionally and i also i know that that country does get rifle hunted so that really left that you know the night before i'm sitting there kind of scratching my head on whether or not it's worth going into this country because i know rifle hunters touch it but i felt like there were multiple pockets that uh you know deer could live in that people weren't going to look into unless they did exactly what we did and uh and to do exactly what we did it's a you got to think out of the box just a little bit to get into some some nice high points so really we only got up onto one high point we could see everything but i just didn't i didn't think too many people would be getting onto that high point and one of the biggest reasons for that is because there's so many deer down below that to keep everybody busy i mean um most guys that drive into that country they can glass from their vehicles and see plenty of deer and uh when that happens in my opinion it it really uh keeps plenty of people from reaching the, the upper portions of those drainages where you get some nice north pockets and that's really what uh that's what we we're focusing on is those just nice isolated nasty thick deep pockets where you're walking you know i think we're just over a mile walk which a mile walk in coos country might as well be four miles in you know desert country sometimes flat country so um we got up into that country and uh we just you know the minute as the sun's coming up you know you made the right choice i mean the deer were just very very active and visible and it was great Okay, so you talk about those um, north-facing pockets, so I assume you're kind of looking into those afternoon shaded bowls, but you are going in at 16 degrees, uh, the sun is coming up, and so when you're glassing, um, wh what were you expecting to see, where were you expecting them to be, and where did they end up being? Kind of tell us, uh, I'm trying to kind of get into the mind of how the expectations were playing through out that morning. Okay. So, um, I'll go back to, you know, we, I hunted that Thanksgiving hunt, uh, a few days during that hunt as well. And that hunt, the conditions were the same, uh, ice cold, clear, just a beautiful, beautiful, uh, just beautiful days with good weather. But for whatever reason, granted there was a full moon, those deer were very, very inactive. And after the first day of seeing that, uh, we instantly switched to looking into north pockets where deer, you know, bedding areas at sunup. And so going into this hunt, I was unsure. I felt, I felt like the deer were going to be very active. A storm had just passed the weekend before. Um, and I, and you know, the moon was, not there just dark at night and i felt like the deer were going to be very active and on the south facing slopes taking in that sun so what we did is we got up on a high point to where we could see basically 360 and uh, we started our morning off looking straight north so south facing slopes and uh and that paid off the deer were on their feet and very very active the intention was to turn around you know get on the other side of the of the point that we were on mid-morning and try to catch some of those deer coming over onto the north slopes if they weren't there to start the day but we knew you know once you get to mid-morning um most of the deer are going to be on the north slopes and that's and that's what happened that you know that's just pretty typical for coos deer and let uh me, let me interrupt you just for a second i want to make a point here that i think you said you were looking north, which would make you looking at south-facing slopes because it was a cold, clear morning. You, you expected deer on their feet, and they surely were. They were out in the open feeding. But you wanted a place that you could also very quickly transition and turn and look south, which would have you looking at the north-facing slope. But just to be clear, in a lot of those situations, when you do make that pivot and that switch, you're looking for deer that are coming from the other side of the mountain that you can't see over now onto what would be the north-facing slope. Is that correct? So 
in essence, there's a time period where if you were to face south right away and look north, those deer wouldn't be there yet. But you are expecting them to come over the top of that ridge, if you will, down into the north facing pockets. Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And, uh, you know, I want to clarify the reason. Um, so if those north, the, the north facing pockets to the south of us, if I mean, we were really there to look into those. Those were, I mean, when we look at this country, we pull up Google Earth or top of mounts, whatever it is, we say those are north slopes that a big buck can live in. Granted, you can see a big buck anywhere, and we're going to look at a, we got to look at a bunch of country, um, you know, a bunch of south facing slopes that we knew would be good. But if those north pockets weren't visible from that point, we probably would not have been on that point. So, uh, Granted, we started the morning looking north, which at south facing slopes. And we did that because obviously we want to look at everything, but we also wanted to give the deer that we are expecting to show up on those north facing slopes. We wanted to give them an opportunity to get over onto those north facing slopes. So uh, essentially, we're just keeping ourselves busy on those south facing, uh, south facing open slopes until the deer came over into the pockets we really want to look at that we felt had uh you know the ingredients for a big buck and uh it just turned out that there the deer were very very active and we ended up seeing just tons and tons of deer we didn't get turned around and looking we almost didn't look at the north slope at all we really made a a critical decision and and i'll get into that but um we were just we were seeing bucks everywhere you know it was just one of those kind of mornings and um <clears throat> very early in the morning the sun really wasn't even out yet i had picked up a really nice buck on 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 that south facing slope which was roughly probably 17 he was roughly 1700 yards from us at that point and uh you know i put the spotter on him and i could tell that he had four points on typical four point on either side um and he but and I could tell he had a decent frame, but it was just tough. The sun just wasn't up high enough. And before it got up high enough to really get a good look at him, he rolled over, not over the top and to the north slope. He just rolled over uh a small finger that ran north and south and just got out of our sight. And so we continued to glass and just before we were done, just before we were getting ready to pack up and head over to look the other direction, uh that buck ended up showing himself again. Um just up out of that crease that he had gone into and and we got a little better look at him and he was really a, a pretty good deer and uh he was something that john likely would have shot um the only thing that had us questioning whether he was a shooter or not is his age he from that distance it's very difficult to tell but he struck us as a four-year-old deer and uh, on this tag with a bunch of time left you know, if you, if John could hold out for a mature deer, which four years is getting, four year olds getting pretty close, but five, six year old deer, that's kind of what he was wanting to do. And, uh, <clears throat> we were, we were very tempted to just go over there and, and, uh, try to get on him. And we, he kind of came down out of sight. And, you know, we said, you know what? Before we just, you know, use up our entire day on him, we came up here to look at these north slopes behind us you know granted we have a potential shooter over there let's let's uh let's turn around and really focus on these north slopes the ones we came up here for in the in the first place and if we don't turn up a shooter here we'll go and try to relocate that buck and uh, and it, that ended up being a critical decision uh we turned around found a few bucks on those north slopes and then uh and then john found that big buck uh you know up in one of those really thick north pockets and uh once they got me on him you know and i i took one look at him i said john that thing that thing is a very very nice deer i mean um we we need to do what we got to do to get that deer killed today okay so you you picked up this deer when you switched around to look south and look into the north facing pockets you said you picked up a few bucks what was their behavior what were they doing and then when John picked up the big deer that you guys ended up killing, what was his behavior? What was he doing? And what time was it? Give me a, give me a timeline. 
so we we didn't get turned around until like after 10 so on a normal day like on a normal november hunt i would have expected those deer to be bedded down already it maybe not maybe you know but p- most of the time um if you have a big mature deer on his feet after 10 you're pretty lucky it, everything you know it happens but you get it's pretty lucky so these deer and this entire morning every deer we looked at was just gorging themselves just eating i mean they were just uh putting the food away what were they and eating? The, everything um lots of just browsing okay. um just your typical oak, oak scrub brush mountain mahogany um just just all your you know just all your typical uh browse not okay. not, not so much grazing okay and uh we turned around found these deer and they were that they were doing the same thing they were just they were feeding um and then you could tell they were getting very close to to bedding down um you know they would kind of get anxious and and walk around uh kind of you know walk around figure eight style just and then they'd find something else they want to chew on so they'd sit there and eat for a bit and then they'd walk a little more 10 more yards and and just stand there and look you know it just looked to me like they were going to bed uh, very quickly and it just so happened that the buck that the big buck was uh, he was within shooting range for john we didn't have to make a stock and uh it took a bit of time finding a place to shoot because we were on a cliff uh, uh we were on a cliff but the cliff came to a point like a, a spine there was no nice flat places to shoot from and uh, we finally john found a place to get set up and uh that buck was in some really thick stuff he finally fed out into some open stuff and um you know john dialed and got set up and he shot and he just grazed his back first shot and uh the deer trotted you know 10 yards he had no idea what happened john got set up on him again and uh he shot again he can't he uh he made adjustment for that elevation chain or that elevation um that second shot you know i was spotting for him and that bullet hit i mean i could have sworn he hit right in the back straps you know right behind the shoulder i told john get you know get back in the gun you missed that thing i mean you hit him but it's not a lethal hit and he says you gotta be kidding you know and that deer ran down out of sight into you know into some really it was a really thick mountain and i i had videoed it not very good footage but uh we watched that thing over and over and that bullet looks like it enters the back strap it just does and uh at a down angle or an up at a down angle yes at a down angle but what we did see is when that deer dropped down into the brush we saw that brush just shaking like like that deer was tumbling so we were kind of on the fence about what just happened and uh we once you know i've i've made some mistakes in my uh hunting career and i've got impatient and just you know i knew better than to just go over there um so we changed angles a bunch of times trying to relocate that deer down in there whether it be alive or dead before we walked over there and i and i i believe that ended up being critical granted he was laying there dead if we would have walked over there and just walked straight down to him we it would have been no issue but if he would have still been alive you know, and he would have jumped up and ran off, we would have likely never seen him again. So, um, if I think if a hunter has an opportunity in that situation where you don't know where you hit and uh, that deer disappears, but you didn't see him leave the mountainside, I would put a bit, you know, trust your glass and just hit that, hit that mountainside, uh, with your glass from as many different angles as you can. And, uh, we did that. And eventually you know, I turned him up dead, laying there dead, and I, it's, I'm still really surprised I even saw him through all that brush, but uh, it was a relief, definitely. You know, you bring up a really good point, and I want to kind of reiterate that. Um, anybody that's shooting anything, but let's take coos deer specifically since we're talking about them, I'm always a firm believer, even if you know the deer was hit well, to a couple of things – Leave a spotter on the cliff side. Let the shooter go down so that if you need to direct, because when you when the sh- when you get down and across a, on a th- thick hillside across, everything looks different. So one 
bit of advice um, from me would be always leave a spotter until the deer is actually recovered where the guy can put his hands on them. Then the spotter can go down to them. That's one bit of advice. The second bit of advice is exactly what you said, uh, Creed, where try and spend some time, try and change your angle to try and pick up that deer, whether dead or alive. Because if you can spot them laying there, you know, a lot of times you spot them belly up and you see the white and that's an immediate sign that, hey, they're, they're down. That's, that's fantastic. The other thing would be uh, mark the deer. If you're by yourself, mark the deer with landmarks on the other side of the hill and take pictures. Uh, if you can take a few photos and maybe even put, you know, get the edit button out on your iPhone and put an X where, you know, below this tree to the right of the, you know, white rock or something like that, at least if you get over there and you're by yourself, you you know that you can find those certain landmarks and go, I know this deer is laying somewhere left of that white rock or below the dead tree or above the yucca or something to give you um, some perspective. So, so Creed, you guys, you, you, you realize that the deer is down and then you go over to the deer. He looked like a, just a fantastic, beautiful, typical deer. Yeah, yeah, he was a great deer. Um, you know, you can't tell in the pictures. He's got just a small, probably quarter-inch, you know, kicker off of his G2 on one side. Um, just long time. Just everything you dream up when you think of a big coos deer buck. And uh, it, it down here in this country, it's so difficult to find a deer with those G3s. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that's it's probably like that everywhere, but long time just long g3s are so difficult to find and uh when you see that in a buck it's just you know a lot of times it's just an automatic shooter so what did you guys estimate that deer to score or have you scored him you know jay we haven't scored him um i you know i think he's gonna he's definitely gonna be over 110 i don't think he's gonna i just don't think he's gonna be above 115 um so he's somewhere in that ballpark, 110, 115. I, you know, I'm to the point anymore. You know, it's kind of the opposite of most people. And everybody, you know, I think I drive a lot of people nuts because I just don't score a lot of the stuff that I shoot anymore. But, um, you know, if I can hold off on scoring something anymore, I just do it. I, I almost hate a, a number being attached to an animal sure. anymore you know so totally get uh, it but my yeah, eye not, my eye told me he was that. probably a 115 type buck and i totally hear what you're saying and and respect that i was just more curious on from what i thought the deer you know it's rare um you know that a deer like what you guys shot is you know upper upper echelon of deer that will be harvested in arizona this year and so for people to get to see it and kind of go okay that's a 110 that's a 115 i think that's good and i think that's great if if you choose not to score every deer you shoot and that's not a priority i think that's fantastic um but i definitely think it's a teens you know a, a, a you know plus 110 and and you know you you're probably right maybe just under 115 but a phenomenal buck uh, in any regard, I have a question about the hillside that the deer was living on. You, I've gathered that it was a real thick hillside. Um, how thick? Are we talking manzanita just choked like you can't hardly see any pockets? Like I'm trying to get um, one more piece of the puzzle of four guys in trying to determine um, like if, if you were to just look at that hillside with your eye, would you say that's too thick or would you say, no, that's perfectly thick for a big buck, very hard to see into. And, you know, I'm trying to get a sense of where that big buck was living. Yeah. So, um, it was very thick, Jay, just, I mean, very thick. The bottom half of it was, um, borderline unglassable. Okay. The top half of it was glassable. It had burned at one point in time. So um, so do you think it was a function of that? That was just the sanctuary area. Exactly why you got up on that rock point is because it was thick, but it also had access where there was some little bit more open stuff for them to just squirrel out of and get right into the thick stuff to lay down. Yeah, 100%. And, and what really, uh, you know, draw 
what really drew me to say that that north slope and i believe that's what drew the deer to that north slope as well is so the the, the brush the trees that were on that uh north slope was um it had a, a few small pines it had a bunch of pinon um it had a bunch of oak trees the, and now the oak trees are recovering oak trees from that fire so they're really dense and they're, they're not your typical umbrella shaped oak trees with a canopy they're more uh you know they they're just denser and and that shrubbery that thick shrubbery is on the bottom half of the you know the tree ra mm -hmm. rather than the top half yep um now i there's tons of hillsides north hillsides just a, a, a little insight into what i don't like ab and about some thick mountainsides that i don't think the deer like either is there's a few, and in, in even in this area, especially in the higher drainages, where there's tons of pinon trees, but the soil is kind of whitish limestone type soil with no grass whatsoever, no oak trees whatsoever, just 100% pinon. And um, those, you know, those same hillsides, which is half of those are in the same country that this buck is living in you can look at that stuff and never see a deer on it. It's just the food isn't there for them. So this hillside, it had a nice mixture of pinon, oak, small pines, and, but grass, the, the undergrowth of all that tree, you know, every little bit of uh, sunlight that makes it into onto that hillside grows some grass. And that's a big deal. But what's even uh, a bigger deal in my opinion is if you you know you visualize a big a hillside or big mountain base that runs uh, north and south and then that ran east and west which you cr created that north slope but the big mountainside that was adjacent to the the mountain or the hillside that this deer was killed on is full of really good veg what I consider good vegetation for them to eat in that um, and and it just I would say that it was roughly 40% Mount Mahogany. And so that deer is literally 200 yards from what I consider the best, uh, vegetation, you know, in coos deer country at, uh, in all coos deer country. So this deer with a 200 yard walk can be eating Mount Mahogany and then come back right onto this mountainside and still be in good vegetation to eat, but be in shade and be, um, unseen to most hunters. Very good. When when you got over to the deer, I'm curious what the deer sign as far as trails, tracks, etc. were on that side of the hill. Was it very evident that that deer had been that deer and others had been spending a lot of time right there for 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 years, like that? You know, Jay. That's a great spot. Um, that's a good question. And and to be honest with you, there weren't a lot of deer living on the hillside that he lived on. Uh, there were tons of deer living on those hillsides, those grassy hillsides with the Mount Mahogany on it. Yep. But as far as the, that, that nasty thick pinon covered hillside that he lived on, I think he was, you know, him and a few other bucks were the only deer living on that hillside. It, there was very little deer sign. We did find some buck sign on the edges of it, which tells me that, you know, it's, it's likely that buck leaving that buck sign and those other, you know, they leave that hillside to kind of feed maybe at night on those on that big open face and they come right back down into that to bed. I mean, I think that was his bedroom, but I, he definitely did not share it with a bunch of other deer. Okay. That's good stuff. Um, so we're kind of mid, mid December, um, moving into, you know, the Christmas time after Christmas time frame where you've got, uh, archery deer hunters, you've got rifle, uh, uh deer hunters that are probably going to be hitting it hard, uh, after Christmas and my question is a deer like that in your opinion that's so close to access to quite a few other does and whatnot um it, do you look for specific places like that as this rut starts to progress where where can a buck come out of the thick stuff come rut does and go back into the thick stuff then go rut does and come back is that something that enters your mind uh yeah it yeah, definitely. Um, but I'll, but I'll be honest with you when I hunt, especially in December, I mean, uh, 
January, you know, January is one thing, but like for these upcoming rifle hunters in the Southern units, at least in, in the portion of the state that I focus in, I personally don't look at any, I don't look at country. Um, if, if I would look there in October, November, that's where I'm looking, even in late December, I don't personally think those big bucks are moving very far away from their core areas in, in December. And, and the reason for that is I don't, on most years, there are very few does that uh, are even close to cycling in December. Granted, the bucks are up and moving and more active, and he, and they will venture out of their you know their bedrooms um, a few hundred yards to a quarter mile or so to maybe uh, make some scrapes and check some scrapes and maybe interact with the does a little bit. Um, but it like for this deer, it wasn't very far for him to have to travel to at least mingle with a few does. And, and even then, I, I just don't think he was interested in that. It, from everything I can tell, um, it, in comparison to last year, we're about a week behind schedule as far as the rut schedules. That's what it's trending towards. You know, I, you can't predict what's really going to happen. But from what I can tell, uh, I wouldn't expect. I would expect very little rut activity for coos deer um, with even a you know with these rifle tags or even the archery hunters. Okay. on older on older age class deer now your two-year-olds and some of your three-year-olds and obviously your one-year-olds you, you're probably going to see some movement and you're going to see some sniffing around and you're going to see some a little bit of chasing and um to me you know that that uh kind of makes some people feel like i i, I feel like that hurt people seeing that kind of hurts them as far as killing a big buck goes because that might lend them to believe that the rut's starting when it realistically, from what I can tell a lot of the times that, that that's just their hormones kind of, you know, making them want to rut and the bucks just do buck things. Um, just acting like teenage boys, you know? So I, I just, I hear it all the time. And even some of the rut reports that, you know, you've given lately from other people, um, it just appears to me like people are seeing the young bucks doing the young buck things. And I, I hate to see a person draw this coveted tag and then start focusing on uh, down down in this country. Now, no, central Arizona is probably a different story. And, and um, you, you know, this strategy might change. But in my opinion, focusing on these areas with a lot of does expecting a big buck to come into those does and, and, you know, start trying to sniff around at, you might end up hunting into the rest of the hunt and not have an opportunity at a big buck. So that, you know, I'm just trying to prevent people from making that mistake. Yeah. And I would go a step further. I agree with what you're saying. I would go a step further. If shooting a mature buck is what you're looking for and you're seeing, you know, little young, small bucks chasing does, I think you need to keep yourself from, I think what I hear you saying, which I totally agree with, is change your mindset of, if I'm seeing that, I'm looking in the wrong place, I need to turn and focus more on the thick and nasty and the north facing, and think about where the big bucks are going to be laying, and let the, you know, they're letting the young, immature deer chase the does around, but all of a sudden, you know, when the rut actually really hits in January, they just come right out of there, boom, they go right over the does, and they take over. But you've got to find those pockets where the big bucks are laying, they're, they want shade, they don't want to be out in the sun, they want food, they want water, they want cover, they want to hide from hunters. Um, and so that's what you need to be looking for. The last time we talked, um, we were talking about the rain and the drought. How did that last storm um, weigh in? Um, it, it helped a little Jay, not much. What, I mean, did it was puddle some, some water? It did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, you know, up there where we were glassing from those, those rocks had, you know, puddles that were an inch and a half deep. So it definitely helped in that regard. It didn't, you know, the Creek bottoms, you know, any low spots did hold water, but the creeks didn't start running any more than they, they were surprisingly though. Um, some of the country that I was really worried about, you know, worried about it drying up, that stuff, uh, the water, you know, the creeks that were kind of drying up and becoming intermittent, 
they maintained their same amount of flow. So it was actually a relief, uh, that those deer up in the wilderness, you know, I, and, and when I'm talking about the moisture drying up and I'm worried about it, it's, I'm really talking about deer in that really a uh, deep wilderness country where there aren't cattle. Right. So where they're, they've been relying on, uh, permanent water like creeks their entire lives and if that was to go away i was concerned but i i think not not much change from november to december so uh it was a relief got a couple questions here from instagram followers um want to dive into we've got in thick country how long do you glass in one spot before moving and and for that um I mean, there's it very var- so many variables. Is it rut period? Is it January? Is it December? Is it October? Is it November? Uh, let's take this basis of the question on your primary what you would do in glassing in one spot uh, before moving in thick country. Let's say October, November, December. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, it, even into January, my the way uh, that I approach it's not going to be much different. So. And there's no magic number. You know, I can't say 20 minutes, go 45 minutes, then it's time to leave it. There's no magic number. When I decide to pick up and leave is when I feel like I've seen all the deer on that hillside or most of them. And that could be 10 minutes. That could be an hour and a half. That could be all day. It just depends on the deer activity and how thick it is. So, um, it, and if it's so thick that I got to stay there all day to see what's on it, I've got to have a pretty good feeling that there's a big buck on it for me to even begin to hunt that stuff that thick. But, um, I basically let the activity dictate what I do. So, um, if they're on their feet and I'm seeing deer, um, and then I see some more deer and then some more deer, I'm not leaving until I stop seeing new deer. You know, if I continue to see, new deer every 20 minutes then I, i'm not leaving and uh if i've been looking at the same deer for an hour and i haven't turned up any new deer but the deer that i am seeing are on their feet well it might be time to move that's just it's just an experience thing and uh you just have to kind of get a feeling for it and and i can tell you right now i know lots of times I get up and leave and I am certain that there's a big buck on that hillside, but you know, at some point you got to make a decision. Do I go look at new country or do I stay here? So uh, tricky question to answer, but even in January, I, it's the same thing. When I feel like I've seen all the deer on that hillside, then, then I move. Another question. How far will a coos typically travel to water? I think ideally they uh, they like to be within a mile and a half, but I know of multiple instances, especially in the really low density, um, de- low deer density desert country that is is just dry country to begin with. I know of some bucks that are living in places right now that the nearest water that I'm aware of, and I've gotten actually gotten pictures of them on that water, so I know they're using it. Is, is you know three miles so uh, there's a there's a small amount of deer that will travel you know three miles to get water and then go back next question biggest coos you've seen on the hoof in arizona oh 133 is the biggest deer that i can you know say i know for sure how big he was i've seen lots in the 120s and uh you know when you see a deer in the 120s i'll be I'll be quite honest with you. I, if I see a deer in the 120s, it's very difficult for me to say that was 130 inch deer because I'm conservative by nature. And on top of that, that's just a lot of inches to count. <laughs> so there's potential that I've seen bigger, but I, I can't say so for sure. Yeah, I hear you. When they get that big, it's just like saw another big buck and it You're doesn't right. really yeah. matter if he's 120 or 130. Uh, do coos bucks rut the same in the same area year after year? In your opinion? Hmm. Yeah. Yes and no. So, um, I think, and each deer is different, just like humans. Um, the older a deer gets, it seems to me like that the 
the older he gets, the closer he stays to his bedroom to rut. And uh, that, like I said, that varies from deer to deer. So the but, tighter the, the more mature the buck, the tighter his circle becomes. That's I, my yeah. I that's my opinion. That. I agree with yeah. that a hundred percent. Some some deer, on the other hand, I've seen them rut. You know, I've seen them rut one year here, and I go back and look and look and look for that thing, and I cannot find him. And then I just get lucky and catch him rutting a mile and a half away the next year. And so it, it, it's just, it just varies. Tough question to answer. Let's see. Will coos buck, bucks respond to grunt call, doe bleat, or any type of calling? Yeah, absolutely. I have had so much luck using uh, deer grunts, doe bleats and rattling um when it, it, when specific oh, when specific um it, you're typically well every call works better at a different point in time so i would say like if rattling works better during the pre-rut like beginning of january before buck, bucks start to breed do excuse me before bucks start to breed does and they're cruising any bit of activity like you know, two deer fighting, they just, you know, they want to get in on that action. So, uh, pre rut is best for rattling and then post rut to some degree. Um, doe bleats just pre rut as well. It's just like a cow call for a bull elk. Um, it's just very difficult to get them to hear that bleat, but if you can get in close and use it, uh, pre rut into the peak of the rut um if they're on a hot doe it's unlikely they're going to come off of that hot doe to come check out another doe bleat but um you know if they're in between hot does definitely uh, and then grunt calls work basically throughout the, all stages of the rut from the pre-rut for the same reasons that uh, rattling works to the peak of the rut um if it's if bucks are they're, they're very territorial and when they have a hot doe and they're locked down on a hot doe, they are so used to other bucks, especially small bucks coming in there and trying to, you know, just get a smell of that doe and chase her around. They are ve- most mature bucks are very intolerant to that. And if you get close enough, very similar to a bull elk, you get in their bedroom and bugle or you get in, you get in tight to him on a hot doe and, and he hears that grunt. It, it will pull them right to you a lot of the time. Okay, got a question here. Uh, best tips for sealing the deal in the last 100 yards on a stock with a bow? Hmm. So, you know, Jay, to answer this, it's going to be a little long-winded, and I apologize for that. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I believe it's important to start at the beginning for the listeners, because there's so much that has to go right just to get to a hundred yards. So, um, you know, I rifle hunt, no, or I archery hunt realistically, no different than I rifle hunt. I get up on high points. I glass the same bowls, the same fingers, the same faces, everything. And when I find a shooter buck, um, that's where the that's where the difference starts R- with a rifle many times you can make a move immediately or you you know you put them to bed and once you got them to bed with a rifle at that point uh it's likely you're going to kill that deer uh, with a bow i very rarely stock make a start making a stock um before like 11 in the morning i give the wind and the thermals an opportunity to settle and do what they're going to do and start you know thermals start rising and uh let the wind kind of start going one steady direction so you know which angle you got to come from and then uh you know once that and then i make sure the deer bets down Uh, i might maybe try to get closer to the deer while he's on his feet and then sit down and glass from there and watch him bed but i i want that deer to bed and many times i I watch him until he gets up and beds for a second time to make, I just want to know that that deer is going to be in his, you know, the location he's going to be in for quite some time. Uh, before I leave for a stock, I do what you were talking about earlier, 
where I memorize landmarks and it is ultra critical. This part is so critical because when you get on the hillside that the deer's, you know, bedded on, it looks completely different. So, and many times I'll take a picture with my phone just so I know, oh man, there's a century plant here, a green rock here. I, I'm right. You know, this deer has to be right underneath me. And, uh, once I make my stock, I never come from underneath them. I mean, 97% of the time I will not come from underneath them unless it's a very gradual climb. And, uh, you know, sometimes that, that'll work out, but I'd recommend against it in most cases then I, I get behind him. And so often you get over there and realize the wind's not doing what you it was doing when you left. So you almost have to make a judgment call on the backside of the mountain that that deer's bedded on. Um, if, if he is on a, uh, on a mountain or something or a ridge, if he happened to be bedded in the flats, well, that's nice because you can just kind of get downwind and go. But um, never will I give up elevation to go completely down will downwind of a deer. So I would, you know, more than half the time that I'm stalking a deer, I have the wind on, on a, and this is from that last hundred yards closing in on that last hundred yards. I have the wind on many times on my left cheek or my right cheek. So, you know, three o'clock, depending on which route I decide to take. And also before I start my stock, when I'm looking at landmarks, I try to memorize shooting lanes as well. And so it's very difficult to think of all that and then, and then make an hour stock or two, you know, sometimes it's two hours just to get in position um, and, and keep all that in your brain, but it's super critical. And uh, once you get over there and you decide what the wind's going to do, um, you pick a kind of many times you're coming up over a rise or a ridge from the South facing slope over onto the north side and you're coming kind of at an angle with not necessarily straight down to them unless the wind is straight in your face and um at that point you know i see a lot of people take their boots off that's something that i choose not to do um because if that deer was to move you know or maybe gets in a fight and he there's a million things that could happen i want to be able to uh stay mobile so i leave my boots on um uh, once and then now I'm kind of getting into probably answering the question that was originally asked and uh, that is closing that last 100 yards. So before I get to where I'm um, even on the same hillside, I typically put on knee pads. <laughs> and if I feel like I'm going to be visible to that deer at any point, um, I'm crawling. Uh, you know, and it's always um, it's it always brings a lot of anxiety from the time you leave where you glass that deer up from to where you get onto his hillside because you're concerned the entire time that he got up and he left. So I, I really try to make that happen as fast as get on his hillside as fast as possible. And then I really slow things down. And, uh, <clears throat> it's important to be super focused at this point because this next, you know, that last hundred yards can take hours. And when you get into shooting, once you get into shooting range, and realize that the deer is there. I mean, that it relieves all anxiety for me at that point. Um, if I'm within, you know, my effective range and I have a lane, I'll stop right there. I, I don't think it's necessary to get 20 yards from the deer just because he's still bedded. Granted, in with the, with the way that they like to lay down and the places they'd like to lay down, many times you have to get 30 or 40 yards from them just to have an angle on them. I would say, so I've killed nine archery coos deer um, in my life in Arizona, and I would say that five or six of them have been under 40 yards. And, that, and that's just the way, that's just the way the contour of the mountainsides, uh, you know, it, it makes you get that close to get a shot. So uh, if once I get into range, I will stop, and, and I know the deer's there, I will stop. And I'll just sit there. And many times it is hours. So I recommend keeping a jacket on you, even if it's somewhat warm, because you don't want to get cold sitting there. Um, and at that point, you just be patient and you wait. And uh, there's so much more to it. It's such a complex. Um, it's just a, such a complex thing. And you have to be able to adapt and make 
choices at the last minute for it to work out. One thing I will say is that, especially if it's a, a target, just a really special deer and you don't want to blow him out, if things aren't perfect and he's not in a position where you have a high probability of getting on him, just back out. You know, that's what I recommend. Um, I can, I, you know, I, I, I rambled on long enough there. I kind of lost track of where I was at. No, I mean, I think you're covering it great the last hundred yards. I get that question a lot, people asking me, and what I see, the mistakes that I've made and the mistakes that I see people making are in that last hundred yards or so and they get very impatient and they've done all the preparation they've done everything right and then they get impatient and they move too fast they they you almost have to for lack of better way to explain it tell me your thoughts on this you almost have you have for one you have to believe that the deer has not moved and he's in the exact same position you have to believe it in your heart you cannot go into it halfway you have to believe that he's there and you have to do everything right that he's there and he he can hear you if you make a mistake number two would you agree that if you almost treat it like if he hears you if he sees you pretend like you're sneaking up some on someone you're in war almost and if he hears you or he sees you he's going to shoot you and if you go with that much intensity as far as trying to do everything right, instead of just blowing them out, you actually think if he sees me or smells me or hears me, he's going to shoot back. You're going to do things a lot differently. Tell me your thoughts on taking that much intensity and belief that I need to do everything right into the field and how critical that is. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you said all that because it's spot on. Um, what one thing that I see many people like, especially people just starting out is once they get into that hundred yard range, um, it's sometimes I just know so many people who have been in this position. It's almost like they just, they realize that, that uh, you know, they, it's going to be very difficult from here on out. It's going to be very time consuming. And they almost kind of hope that the deer will tolerate them getting to within shooting range and they hope it works out and you're you're 100 right if if you go into it with the that amount of intensity and you believe that you know if if they hear you then it, you know that's the world's going to stop turning that i mean that's really what it takes it takes a totally different level uh, mindset then most anything, um, you know, most any sport and, you know, I grew up playing sports and, and that's helped me tremendously with stalking these deer mindset wise, but it's like on a, it's a, you know, it's a different level of, uh, you know, just getting your mind in the right place and you have, you really have to want it so bad, um, that, you are going, you, you know, you're going to be willing to get stuck doing a half squat and your legs are just burning and you're sweating. And you know that if you move a muscle at that point in time, because the gust, you know, the wind had been gusting and it stopped and you're standing on a, you know, a branch that's about to break, it's going to be over. You, you know, it, it, it's just super important to have that mindset a few things that, you know, I left out that I feel are ultra critical is, um, and I know guys who do this, they get in that range, they get 150 yards, they're about to start rolling over onto where that deer is. And then they take their binoculars off and their jacket off to leave behind. And, and my binoculars, even at 50 yards, 40 yards are my most critical tool because those deer, even at 40 yards, you will not see them without you know, lifting your binoculars to your face and peering through every blade of grass, every branch, it's almost like glassing for them all over again. And many times the, in, in that uh, time span that you were relocating to get on the hillside that they're on, they might have got up and moved 20 yards. So when you realize that maybe they're not under the tree that you thought they were, then at that point, it's almost time to start glassing all over again, you know really slow all over down underneath you and around you and um 
because likely they're not very far. Even if they moved, you know, got under a different tree, the likelihood is that they did not move more than probably five or ten yards, and you just need to pick them up again. But don't yeah, you very... need to act like they're still right there? I think, I think you make a good point of a lot of people don't realize how much mental toughness it takes to just know that that deer is still right there, even if he's not under the in the exact bed he was in. He's literally within a couple of yards, and you just have to find him, or you have to wait him out. And I give people a lot of times advice of when you get to 100 yards and you have time and you've got the season, some people are just better off to get to that 100-yard mark and hopefully wait them out and hope that that deer comes to them because you have basically a 50% chance that the deer is going to get up and work his way towards you. Um, you know, and maybe not a hundred yards, maybe it's 60 or 70 and then just be patient and hope that the deer makes a mistake. I think a lot more people would be, and, and please, if you disagree with me, let me know. But I think a lot, a lot of people would be a lot more successful with their archery hunting if they would get into that 60 or 70 and not try and close that additional 20, 30, 40 yards and then let it happen. And if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But it seems like people are so time uh, conscientious and, you know, time crunched that they've just got that one day to hunt. And I get it. But the reality is, you know, nine times, 99 out of 100 times, you're going to spook that deer when you get much closer than 60 yards. Yeah, I mean, you basically took the words out of my mouth. And that goes for every animal, not just coos deer, especially during the rut. Um it, you know, is, if there's a hot doe on that hillside, one huge problem is there's likely going to be other bucks. I can't tell you how many times it's happened where you are within range and you were just waiting for, you know, that buck to stand up. And a two point comes, you know, just trailing that that doe scent and, and comes 10 yards from you and stands there and blows out of there and takes the other two deer with him, you know. And so... Uh, yeah, that, that is, the, I think that's a killer tip, especially during the rut. Um, if you can stop it at a hundred yards, then do so. It, one problem is on steep hillsides. You, it, it's very difficult to do that because you don't know if they're, the, you don't know where they're at a lot of time until you get within 60 yards of, you know, oh, wow, there's the tree. You know, I thought I was much higher, much lower. So, you know, great tip though. Uh, we've got several more questions here. Um, I know we're a little bit limited on time. I've got one here. Explain north facing slopes and how far you are glassing, trying to see eyes, ears, uh, belly, antler tips, uh, etc. I think you and I have talked about the north facing slopes, uh, quite a bit in several of our podcasts. But that does bring up a question of how far do you typically, what is the magic uh, number for you, f you know, out on that rocky point that you were talking? Um, and obviously every situation is different, but if, if you could draw it up, how far would you want to be from that north facing slope? You know, we were at, we were 550 from that slope and, and we, you know, we just didn't have any other choice. Um, I think if I think anywhere from 500 to 1200 yards is, you know, I think that's, those are realistic yardages. You, you know, you're only going to be able to get as close as the mountains allow you to get. So I many times, um, especially if I'm hunting from, which is 90% of the time, the way I do it, I'm hunting from the North going South. And I like to get up and look into as many north slopes as I can while, you know, throughout the day headed south. So many times when you peek up and over a new one, you have no choice but to be 300 yards. And and, that, and it, you, it just changes um, how fast you climb up and over into and get set up. And at that point, you know, it, it's not that's not ideal to be three or four hundred yards, in my opinion, from one of those north slopes. I'd much rather be seven, 800 yards just because I have that freedom to move around. But, um, if you get in that position, you got to just quietly set up and you, you know, you got to be, uh, conscientious about, 
your tripod noise and you, just everything your food you know food wrappers and because those deer can and will hear you and uh you you know you got to set up and just pick it apart so uh, yeah 500 to 1200 yards is probably ideal for me i was just gonna say that i was thinking about that when you were talking i think a lot of people that are new to coos deer hunting don't understand that there's several kind of barriers or windows where you know when you when you hunt antelope you can get you know four five three four five hundred yards from them and they'll just kind of stay out there in the wide open and they'll but you start closing the gap and they all of a sudden don't like it i would say about 600 yards 550 to 600 yards and closer is where you can't tr uh, clank tripod legs together. You cannot talk. You have to whisper. You cannot have your radio up and have someone, the squelch, come on and without the deer knowing. They will know you're there at, you know, 500 to, if you're inside of 550 or 600 yards, they can see you really, really well. If you just pop right out on an open face or out on and just sit out on an open rock exposed, um, they can see you. If you're in the sun, they can see you. That's why I like to, just like what you're saying, I like to be about that 800 yard mark and they can still in some situations, if the wind's right, they can hear you. They can still, if the sun's in the right spot, they can see you. But if you can stay 550 yards away from those deer as much as you possibly can, that's going to give you an opportunity to have a little bit of flexibility and not be so ninja style. Um, and, and conversely, when you start getting closing that 500 yard gap, you know, Dar and I have always for a long time had a rule of we never get inside of 300 yards of a deer we want to kill. We're talking about rifle hunting. So when we're guiding hunters in Mexico, unless we've made a mistake or unless there was no other option, we will not go closer than 300 yards because I've seen it so many times when you get closer than 300 yards, the deer end up figuring you out. They end up winding you. They end up seeing you. They end up smelling you. They end up hearing something and they're on alert. And then instead of them standing up out of their bed and they just kind of start feeding, they stand up and literally bolt or they stand up and immediately walk and cause they know you're there. So realize that these deer are very very particular and that you need that distance barrier to kind of have that cushion where they don't know you're there um and i think rifle hunters they don't realize and and i shouldn't say rifle hunters i think a lot of rifle hunters that i've seen don't realize how aware of their surroundings coos deer are and i think even more than a lot of different animals it just seems like they're their heads on a swivel they can they can see you know they're locked on you they can hear certainly i've been sitting glassing on ridges on arizona public land and you know literally guys eight nine hundred yards away i can hear them talking well if i can hear them the deer can dang sure hear them um so that would be some tips that i would give creed uh i want to finish with uh, moving into the January season, the over-the-counter archery deer, um, for those listening in Arizona, it's archery deer, it's any deer, so you can shoot a mule deer or a coos deer. Um, tips in general for people that are going to be um, archery deer hunting during the rut, um, give me the couple minute version as opposed to, we could dive and talk for hours, but give me just some tips for those archery hunters. Well, uh, just, you know, quickly here, I think, um, you got to sit down and think about how bad you want to harvest a deer with your bow and let that kind of dictate the style that you choose to, uh, you know, to partake in. It, it is such a dry year. <laughs> it, I got to believe that, um, there's going to be quite a bit of deer harvested off water this January. I, even with the cold temperatures, the 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 vegetation is dry, and the deer just they're just not getting what they would normally get out of the vegetation, uh, moisture wise. So that's I think they're going to be watering a little more often. Um, don't be afraid to utilize calls, especially in the pre rut. Um, 
Yeah, that goes for mule deer as well. Uh, I do believe that everybody that intends to hunt in January uh, mule deer are going to be in for a treat, at least in this region, because I do believe the rut is it's trending towards being a week later than normal. So here where normally a lot of those does uh, would be getting bred here in the next few days, the big bucks aren't even on them yet. So it's looking like that first to second week in January is going to be the ticket. So if you, you know, you got a little bit of time, you got to pick some days to hunt and you want to hunt mule deer. I would consider hunting that first and second week coos deer. If they follow the same trend, there's no way to really know, but you know, middle of the month to the third in potentially even the fourth week of the month uh, might be your better days, you know, and just, I think we talked about mindset. Um, you really want to shoot a deer with your bow. You need to kind of almost have that monk like mindset, just laser focus and you really got to want it and, you know, go give it everything you got. Awesome, buddy. Thanks for coming on and sharing with us today. I, the listeners love uh, hearing your strategies and your tactics. Congratulations on that deer with, uh, with your friend. Um, what is your own plan coming up uh, for the, the, the new season and the new, the new year in 2021 as far as will you be archery hunting uh, quite a bit for deer? Yeah, Jay. So that's probably the last time you'll ever have to ask me that question because the answer is always going to be the same. And that's, yeah, <laughs> if that's, you're yeah. alive and you're kicking, you're going to be hunting archery deer in January. Right. So it looks like this year, most of my, you know, the time off that I'm going to have is towards the, in the back half of the month. So my, most of my focus, like every year, will be on coos deer. And if the right mule deer uh, makes an appearance, you know, maybe he better watch out because I'll probably send an arrow over his back and scare him. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll definitely be out there and I'll be giving it heck. And I'm searching for coos deer, archery coos deer number 10 and uh, pretty much committed to making sure that's the biggest one yet. So, yeah. Awesome, buddy. Well, we'll touch base with you after I get back from Mexico and uh, best of luck to you on your hunt. And again, appreciate you coming out. Uh, I'll, I'm going to link up uh, your Instagram uh, handle uh, for the guys out there so they can come find you and follow you on Instagram. And, and as always, God bless. Uh, uh, happy uh, New Year to you guys and Merry Christmas and uh, just happy holidays to your whole family. And uh, we'll be chatting at you down the road here. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jay. Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas and good luck in Mexico. Look forward to seeing what you guys turn up. All right, buddy. Take care. Yeah, bye. bye.